Hi. So today I want to um, discuss mimetic theory, uh, originally coined um, to, developed by René Girard, and why um, uh, Rebel Wisdom, uh, the YouTube channel and the kind of the project that I follow with various interesting thinkers, uh, why they should um, interview Jean-Pierre Dupuy. Um, one of the, the proponents of mimetic theory. Um, so, uh, René Girard uh, was also a mentor of um, Peter Thiel, the, the tech, the, the tech uh, investor and guru and co-founder of PayPal. Uh, and Peter Thiel uh, said in one video, also available on YouTube, that um, René Girard and his mimetic theory was the reason why actually he invested in Facebook as one of the first investors, maybe the first outside investor, I don't know, the, one of the first investors. Mm. So, uh, mimetic theory, um, it kind of fits with rebel wisdom and with their project of kind of connecting science with spirituality, with um, religion and kind of like uh, this kind of uh, uh, thinking beyond new atheism, uh, maybe thinking that includes also cognitive science, thinking that includes um, uh, complexity science and uh, various kind of aspects of how we look at the world uh, with the um, uh, not a naive or new age perspective or kind of uh, overly esoteric kind of uh, wishy-washy kind of thinking but uh, kind of uh, connecting uh, hard scientists sciences and kind of spirituality kind of uh, uh, thinking about uh, philosophy and thinking about beyond science and where the science is grounded what is what are our mind mind um uh, mental models, what are our um, uh, mind frames, I don't know, not really mind frames, anyway. So, mimetic theory, uh, it's kind of very close to theory of everything, or kind of, it really goes really, really deep. Uh, it's basically, it has some kind of, maybe like five key words that uh, we could discuss. I watched one great video where there were these five uh, thoughts discussed. But Jean-Pierre Dupuy is uh, one guy, because René Girard, he died like four years ago. So he's like also teaching at Stanford, where also René Girard was teaching and where Peter Thiel was studying. So the mimetic theory talks about basically imitation and uh, how our minds are um, uh, prone to imitate uh, each other constantly. So our desires are um, mediated through others. So basically there, the, these desires are not ours, but they are like kind of uh, we just happen to be uh, in some kind of uh, social circle, in some kind of network uh, where they are our close friends and they very much influence each other. So, you know, this kind of theory is kind of going a bit to complexity theory or network theory, uh, where you, you, you know, these kind of examples where uh, your weight is maybe an average of your five closest friends, your net worth is kind of similar to maybe net worth of your clo uh, net worth of your uh, five closest friends these kind of ideas um, could be quite connected with the fact that we really influence each other and often our desires are mediated through others so if someone wants a car in particular car let's say tesla it's kind of uh, and i respect that person for some reason <coughs> it might be my good friend uh, then suddenly i might also feel very interested in Tesla or let's say some other car um, or just the idea that I should have a car why I don't know because friends around me have a car so maybe I should also get a car not to be a kind of um, I don't know not to fall behind uh, um, 
so and this this kind of ideas can um, so maybe the first idea with mimetic theory is that um, it's from the word memes from like kind of how the memes propagate so mimetic theory how we um, uh, Im imitate each other so <clears throat> this is also a conflict uh, or a theory of conflict or mimetic conflict so we imitate each other and the the, the funny thing is that okay then the next keyword from imitation desire desire the desire ar arises when there is someone we want to imitate and the third word is basically um, uh, rivalry and rivalry uh, happens actually with people that are very close to each other. Maybe you, you know this kind of idea of uh, narcissism of small differences, like uh, ve vegans and vegetarians hating each other for some reason, you know, like, uh, or this kind of, you know, it's often discussed like this virtue signaling or something. But the problem uh, here, or people going to extremes and they're being really nasty to people who are almost like them, actually, maybe just a bit, lit, little bit less unorthodox here and there, but they're quite similar, you know, they're not really that opposite. But the idea uh, captured by mimetic theory, or could be explained somehow also by mimetic theory, not just like, let's say, with some signaling or virtue signaling or something like that, but it could be like explained by rivalry. So basically, uh, Rivalry, re, rivalry uh, happens where there are a bunch of people who try to follow each other and they, they end up in uh, intense competition. So, for example, two friends competing for one job or two friends competing for one uh, lo uh, loud one, like for one girl, one boy, or whatever. So, uh, often this happens when actually we meet very similar people, not different people. So, uh, Mm, then what what often happens like let's say in some rural settings in some rural bar people get to fight each other because they I don't know they just like happen to I don't know uh, take the last uh, dinner or take the last uh, piece of clothing or piece of or the, the last thing that it's available on, in the on the bookshelf or in the um, in the shop and they can kind of fight, I don't know, about some chicken or something like that. Um, it's often because people get in the proximity with each other and they happens, their desires happen to converge on uh, one single thing that somehow is very appealing just because the other person wants it. Uh, because, according to René Girard, the... the the desire is medi mediated, it kind of arises just because of the other guy is there and he wants this thing, so now I suddenly also happen to want the, this thing. So then the imitation, desire, rivalry, and then uh, the other thing is violence. So often, okay, you, you know this like, okay, this pub kind of fights for some reason uh, happen uh, in some areas, but um, uh, violence in the past uh, was kind of more common uh, and um, violence uh, needs to be somehow prohibited and this mimetic theory basically explains that uh, violence of all against all is quite expensive very taxing so very expensive like everybody is fighting each uh, each other so it's like this Hobbesian uh, dog eat dog world it's not sustainable it's kind of very chaotic, so much more cheaper actually is for the two rivals, two, two guys who are very similar to actually converge or unite against a third bystander, so against a third person who is a bit different, like he might be or she might be from a minority or she might be from a different religion, she might be from a different persuasion or different political party or something like that. Or it can be a group of people, and so they make this group of people a scapegoat. So it's another word. So there is a, a, a imitation, desire, a, a rivalry, violence, and scapegoating. So scapegoating. Um, so they engage in scapegoating, and what happens through the scapegoating? Uh, 
usually in the past it was there were some maybe some bit stranger people some prophets or some madmen or some uh, like uh, older women who had no one uh, who are widowed or someone no one to to protect them and they were accused of uh, witchcraft or something like that and it actually happens even until today in some corners of the world but uh, mm, what happens then that's the whole kind of uh, uh, village or community unites into kind of persecuting that person often actually in killing that person um, and then what happens, kind of, according to René Girard and um, his mimetic theory, is that the, the whole society suddenly kind of feels a moment or a brief period or period where there is this kind of uh, peace happens. So there is this strong kind of witch hunt, like really a lot of kind of <coughs> a lot of kind of emotions and violence. Uh, of many against one, so the one is the scapegoat, and then suddenly uh, there there is a peace, uh, and uh, the peace is restored, and uh, retroactively people then make the scapegoat into a sacred symbol of the one who brought us peace or something like that. So during the the ancient history, uh, this was kind of um, regular, uh, and People were scapegoating someone, I don't know, uh, killing someone because gods were angry, uh, because there was no, um, um, the harvest was poor or there was no harvest because, I don't know, bad weather, so they had to kind of attack someone because gods were angry, they demanded some kind of sacrifice, the human sacrifice, something like that. So, uh, but with Christianity, this kind of mechanism became more and more apparent and became more and more um, unsustainable. So uh, basically, Jesus was the one who who kind of revealed uh, that this, this kind of scapegoats are innocent. So these victims are innocent, and they are suffering for our sins. René Girard explains this quite well and quite profoundly that these sins are basically based in our rivalry. So. Um, uh, when uh, rebel wisdom discusses uh, <clears throat> discusses uh, or has uh, some very interesting people interviewed, I discussed in the uh, the previous video about da um, uh, Daniel Schmachtenberger that he's now my my favorite thinker along with uh, some other uh, other guys who are in his circle. So there is this forest laundry I just heard a lot, uh, yesterday, uh, amazing three hour podcast with Daniel Schmachtenberger and uh, uh, forest laundry, laundry, laundry. Uh, then there is uh, Jordan Greenhall, uh, amazing guy, and he has a whole kind of series and his mental models explaining things. So it, they, these guys are deep into this complex uh, theory and they are also deep into something what also Brad Weinstein, Weinstein uh, calls, Weinstein calls uh, game B or like transitioning from game A, like the rivalrous economy through some liminal space, through some kind of liminal spaces, like let's say some innovation hubs, accelerator, something where we could actually create something that is on a trajectory to this game B, and game B would be an economy based on anti-rivalrous foundations. What I'm arguing here is that uh, I haven't heard them discuss uh, mimetic theory yet, and I haven't heard uh, other guys discussing mimetic theory, but mimetic theory is quite counter, uh, counterintuitive in a way that it sheds light on rivalry, that rivalry being like maybe the first sin or the original thing, sin, let's say the, the Eve wanting, wanted something that the 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 snake had or the snake actually wanted to be like humans wanted something that the humans had uh, so this is maybe from the bible but then um, this kind of original thing is very abstract but very simple once you get it so uh, is the rivalry itself so since we have to kind of limit the violence the violence uh, is limited or is contained, or let's say, by sacred. So we produce sacred. Is a sacred is exterior, exterior, 
uh, externalized violence basically so sacred is the mechanism of the produce production of sacred scapegoating it's the mechanism uh, how we kind of limit the violence, how we contain violence. So, sacred contains violence in both uh, uh, meanings of the term contain, to contain. So, uh, back to Jesus and the, how he revealed that we are the... Uh, mm, uh, we are sinners because we are blaming and then we are scapegoating innocent victims before in the the ancient times people did, just didn't care they didn't there wasn't even no question is this guy innocent or not gods demand him to die so he will he will die and we will move on with our lives there isn't there are no questions asked but since jesus and since christianity it became more and more apparent over centuries it took maybe thousand years or something um uh, couple of hundred years on and on it's still continuing this process of revelation that those uh, victims are innocent uh, so even if you look at uh, uh, if you look at uh, this kind of phenomena of social uh, justice activists they could be seen as kind of actually a super super christianity or super bug maybe even of christianity you know something like you almost eliminated the christianity through some new atheism or something and it returned really uh really uh, really badly no okay this is this is joke i don't want to complicate it with, with this but basically you can see the, the 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 bits of christianity even in this um in this kind of uh, behavior uh, of kind of really trying to protect the victims and I think actually the the, uh, the, the, the the impulse there to protect innocent victims is quite uh, is really Christian and is really kind of actually uh, justified because those victims are often what would Girard call structurally innocent meaning like there might be this particular person who actually committed actually some actual crime like a theft like he really stole something but because he's a part or a part of some minority that is despised let's say by Europeans could be some immigrant by Europeans and then there is this kind of witch hunt happening now like this kind of anger pouring on those guys and on those specific ethnicity uh, for some reason <coughs> And of course, this particular guy might have stolen something, but this the amount of anger is unjustified. It's not proportional to what the guy did. So there is this kind of um, also element of actually scapegoating just because this is the ancient mechanism we have done since the very ancient times, since the Inca or whatever Aztec uh, uh, and all Greek and whatever ancient civilizations, this is the mechanism that produced sacred, that pro that limited violence, but there were innocent victims who suffered in the course for all us to kind of chill for a while, to kind of limit our rivalry with our colleagues, with our close ones, with our family members, to orient our violence not against each other, but to, uh, against one person who is scapegoated. So, so that guy is structurally innocent. So I'm going back maybe to um, uh, to Peter Thiel. So uh, his book uh, Zero to One is maybe uh, is uh, being uh, Okay, uh, he he uh, is being is maybe one of the best books for startup founders or something like that. It's being along, uh, 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 yeah, loaded, uh, I would say, it's, uh, yeah, it's probably the best book. Uh, sorry, I lost one word here, but so. Uh, zero to one is basically really borrowing heavily or kind of uh, really getting a lot of inspiration from this type of thinking. It's basically the whole point is about that all the sad and uh, sad companies uh, look um, alike and all the happy companies are different. Why they are different? Because there is not much rivalry. Because let's say if you want to open this hipster type of restaurant then all your friends are opening similar kind of restaurants and then you all end up competing with each other, with each other and destroying the, the, the profits, destroying the, the earnings and 
the base and kind of like really being uh, being sad and, hap and unhappy because of the excessive competition. And so maybe I would like to connect this. This is really for me a key piece that the rivalry is quite uh, quite uh, an abstract and important problem. Even like I would like to explore. I I don't have much to offer or to to think about here. But mimetic theory is so counterintuitive or controversial that they, it, it even proposes that the scarcity, so the rivalry, is not product of scarcity, but vice versa. That scarcity might actually, in fact, be produced by rivalry. Uh, technically, we could have all uh, enough to eat or this and that, but we need to sacrifice something to limit the, the rivalry. So we, for example, sacrifice ourselves to work hard um, to kind of produce this mark of sacred or something so we are kind of living this kind of puritan ethics and we are kind of creating rivalry but uh, creating a rivalry because of uh, cre sorry, creating scarcity but creating scarcity because of rivalry because we uh, rush uh, like a horde of uh, horde? like a herd of sheep into one direction and this direction is suddenly jammed and so we are okay so it's like kind of the, like the idea of like okay you uh, make the road uh, wider you add uh, one or two lanes and suddenly there are more cars there uh, again and so it's jammed as it was before because I don't know it's like this kind of behavior of like herd like behavior could create scarcity so uh, at least may, then there might be some kind of positive feedback loop uh, going on in, in, in here so uh, scarcity might produce rivalry and rivalry uh, actually produces scarcity so uh, it's kind of interesting but it's um, it's an important piece for me to to add into <coughs> this idea of um, Okay, abandons economics. Uh, game B: How we could play, how we could create uh, actually the um, foundations for game B for anti rivalrous economics, economy, economics, and key piece is to actually and not underestimate rivalry to maybe uh, motivate people to desire uh, and actually this this is coming uh, back to Daniel Schmachtenberger and uh, Forrest Landry. Uh, they discussed just two days ago. I heard a podcast. They discussed the difference between desiring for feelings and desiring for form, desiring for actually things like position, a car. If you are desiring for car, you might be actually really sad because you might end up having worse car than you desired, or there might be always something better than you. You will be never satisfied. So, like the Buddha was right. You should kill this kind of type of desire or eliminate this type of desire, but. If you desire for feelings, like feelings of freedom, feelings of belonging or something like that, it's really kind of anti-rivalrous. So maybe there is a key piece like, okay, we need to actually kind of um, nudge people, maybe nudge is a bad word, but like motivate or nurture people, uh, nurture the desires uh, for feelings more and nurture, nurture the kind of the uniqueness of each individual and like maybe uh, nurture the the quantity of their interests so and <coughs> and uh, maybe motivate them or uh, to 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 search for things that are kind of very niche maybe uh, so they don't end up in this kind of herd like behaviors that peter Thiel talks endlessly endlessly about so zero to one mimetic theory for the masses i would say but if you want to connect it to Christianity, if you want to connect it to uh, what the rebel wisdom is doing, I would really suggest uh, you approach uh, Jean-Pierre Dupuy, uh, who was teaching at Stanford, I think he's still teaching at Stanford, and who is like the top guy to talk to. Um, actually, I can link also, we did an interview with a friend of mine, Tomasz Uhnag, with Jean-Pierre Dupuy back in like three years ago. And uh, it's in English as well. Um, and um, but I think I would really suggest you to talk. It's it's amazing. This theory is really amazing. And Jean Pierre Dupuy is the is an economist, is a scientist. So in it's is a serious guy who wrote a couple of books like The Economy and the Future. Um, he's on the board of some advisory board for uh, 
concerning climate change in, in France and uh, and it's quite a serious guy so Jean-Pierre Dupuy I advise you to check out mimetic theory uh, there are many other terms I just mentioned five <coughs> So I mentioned Im uh, imitation, desire, desire being mediated. I uh, I mentioned um, rivalry. I mentioned scapegoating as a mechanism to limit the rivalry and violence. Sorry, violence. Then scapegoating uh, as a mechanism to kind of limit or uh, violence, and then sacred as a product of this scapegoating mechanism that um, uh, that is kind of uh, backwards or reinstates uh, the, um, uh, the uh, reinstates peace or brings back peace once the scapegoat <coughs> is being uh, eliminated or something like that so but there are like a couple of other terms key terms there but uh, this kind of mechanism uh, is important and of course now we don't sacrifice people uh, but we sacrifice like say some uh, symbols some kind of um, um, other things some symbolic things uh, so it could be a lot of things that we sacrifice for some reason or maybe sometimes we don't need to we understand the mechanism <coughs> <clears throat> there of how to produce uh, how we produce sacred as a society so thank you for your um, okay guys so may, uh, I will explore this topic further and uh, I hope at least um, I, I got uh, I could convey some something uh, regarding mimetic theory regarding why rebel wisdom should interview Jean-Pierre Dupuy why René Girard is the father of mimetic theory in, is very close to to something of a, like theory of everything and why Peter Thiel um, uses this, this kind of thinking of uh, mimetic kind of theory thinking to do his investments and why it was a source to to write zero to one so take care